The golden minute is a terrifying and wonderful moment where you allow your mind to open up and let ideas pour out. The reason why the proposition of the golden minute is important is because we're, because we're quickly becoming a society of plagiarists and generic copyists. It's something that concerns me, and I've had three decades to see it happen. And to give you a framework of, of what I do and, and the framework of also that I'll explain what I'm talking about in regards to the Golden Minute, I'll show you some of my work. I'm involved in live theater design. I like work that's big, powerful. I like a big audience. I like live performance because I'm, it's what speaks to me, to have something that happens in the moment and can't ever be reproduced in the same way is a challenge that intrigues me and keeps me coming back for more. So I'll show you some of my recent work. Um, the Sochi Winter Olympics, I was one of the principal designers for that. I've done five Olympics opening and closing ceremonies, um, working with George Seepin, an amazing American-Russian director and uh, designer director, and Andrei Bolchenko, a wonderful Russian director. We created the opening and closing ceremony for the Olympics. Very challenging subject. So some of you may have seen this, but it's a, a wonderful event because it really embodies the spirit of collaboration internationally. More than half of my work is done abroad. I love being an American. American designers do very well out in the design world. We're still considered the state of the art. It's one of the last American exports that's still vital. <laughs> We're considered raw, unafraid, brash, sometimes rude, but able to command originality. Here's a case, we'll, we're looking at a spinning ballerina. I knew I, went, I was asked to do the, the symbolic dove of peace for the Olympics. It's a very important moment. You can't use real doves ever since Korea because they got burned up in the cauldron. So you do something, you do something evocative, ephemeral, and Russia's filled with the best ballerinas in the world, and I'm intrigued by how they can spin. So I had 45 of Russia's best ballerinas, and I created a simple headdress that allows them to spin, use, utilizing their great natural skills, and then creating what is essentially the dove of peace, and then finally f forming a big video projection, where I didn't want to do it in a literal way, and I think the Olympics talks more about spirit and evo evocation than it does being literal. Um, and then the mascots. I was asked by Putin himself to do the mascots, and I, I thought they were usually they're very silly, and so I thought maybe if I made them 35 feet tall as robots, it might have some impact, so we did. <laughs> um, Vancouver Winter Olympics. I tend to like the Winter Olympics. There's, a, there's more of a quality of, um, there's a cerebral calmness to the Winter Olympics. The Summer Olympics a little more colorful, and it's bigger, so I have, while I do them, I just signed up for the, the Rio Summer Olympics. I love the Winter Olympics. Uh, Salt Lake City Winter Olympics. Uh, we were the first major American event after, after September 11th, and so it was a complete pressure to do something significant that was still uplifting, but at the same time spoke to the, the tragedy that had just occurred in our country. The Lion King on Broadway, which was taking a cartoon and Julie Taymor and I, my co-collaborator in puppet and mask design, and she being the director of the show, created a piece where I think we transcended the cartoon and very important for us to connect in a spiritual way the, the, the history of Africa we were representing here. And we wanted to do it in a way with spiritual music. And I wanted to create creatures, as Julie did, that represented the animals but didn't take away from the humanity. The Broadway stage is about humans expressing themselves, selling the song. I wasn't going to cover them with fur. So many of you have seen this show. It's been the, the most successful show in theater history. It is in its 17th year. We have nine product productions tonight and around the world, and it has surpassed the film in terms of economics. I work in theme parks for children. I love that format. It's the first art that many children see. I work in Las Vegas for jaded gamblers. Uh, this, I like a broad audience because every artist wants to communicate. 
whether they say they're doing it for their own th self-therapy or not, they're doing it to communicate something. And this is the case with anybody who's creative, and I suspect most people who aren't creative. And I have been unafraid to say that I want to communicate with an audience. I do art for therapy, but it's really designed, I try to see it through another lens, through another, uh, another individual. Here's me working with, uh, on the, the, the love show, Cirque du Soleil's love show, where John Lennon was killed by a, or his mother was killed by a Volkswagen in an accident. Big pivotal time in John Lennon's life, and so we went back and studied his own history, and uh, I made a, this is a very poetic death of his mother, and it was done by this Volkswagen. This is the Volkswagen with the license plate, and it hits her, it dissolves into pieces, and then comes the beginning of a staging act, Cirque du Soleil's Caw, one of the biggest shows ever produced on stage, is uh, still running in Las Vegas. Robert Lepage is the director of this, and he, I have had the great fortune of having heroes that I've always wanted to work with, and one by one, they've called me. And every one of them, I now my bucket list is complete, and I'm still just middle-aged, so they'll be... Um, I'm known for large, super large spectacles, but Robert Lepage and I did uh, Stravinsky's La Razzano, La the Nightingale, and we both... This is very important, because I'm gonna talk about how ideas first spark the ones that just squirt out. He and I both, this story is about a Chinese kingdom on the water, and we said water at the same time, and I said, we must do the show on water. And uh, then I said, you know, I've always wanted to do Vietnamese-style water puppetry. Uh, being an American is a melting pot. I really do go around the world and find techniques that have been used. We make them our own, but we were on a plane to Vietnam in a week and we studied everything we could about, and then we talked the Metropolitan, we talked all these operas into flooding their orchestra pits with water, putting singers waist deep, and playing the show with puppetry. So you can see some of the vignettes. The orchestra we put on stage, filled that pit with water and talked them into it, and it was a really very good success. Um, I also, you know, I'm known for character design and puppetry, but we do, I mostly do scenic design, costume design, writing and directing now. And it's really, uh, over the years, I've really been blessed to have a broad scope of, and now being invited at the very beginning of projects to spark the idea, carry the concept clear through. Um, so you see some of the large things. This is important because I've been using, I'm gonna give a talk that challenges technology. But I use technology like the best of them. I've been using robot arms instead of puppeteers because this robot arm is 27 feet tall and this flower is 45 feet wide. And I can have large scale things that still have the dexterity and choreography and beauty of the human performer. Um, and we control these with joysticks and human performers um, program them. We use 3D printing. All of my sculptures are carved by big robotic arms now. We do digital drawing, we do digital drafting, we sculpt digitally. Without the digital revolution, I couldn't be in Oregon working internationally. And I can communicate so well with others uh, through the use of technology, but I'm going to talk about some of the limits to that. It seems to be a, a recurring theme I see in creative conferences that I attend. Uh, in design charrettes. Um, every, I've had the opportunity of being in many forums where these subjects are discussed. I'm seeing this trend where it was all about technology helping, and now we're on this plateau where some fairly visionary people are saying, I can see where this trend is going. We are going to start talking about the humanization of technology, as you're seeing previous speakers talk about, and how we can make it work for ourselves. I have a proposition for you that's quite simple. And it might very well be the, the simplest and maybe most profound change you can make with little effort in your day-to-day -day work, whatever it is. Everybody in this room problem solves during the day. I, I'm coming from a basis of a creative thinker, but everybody is that. Uh, I've had realtors and bankers write me letters after seeing The Lion King and say, I don't know what happened, I sold eight houses the next week, you know? And there's a, there's a, there's a way in which creativity helps, but Problem solving is something that used to be on a more individual basis. I grew up, there's a frog that sings Frank Sinatra's songs. It's uh, 63 feet wide. 
uh, on top of a waterfall in Las Vegas. Uh, I grew up without much technology. I grew up in a logging community in southern Oregon in a religious community that didn't have television, didn't have books, and really wasn't exposed to anything cultural or artistic, and yet I was a gifted artist. It was just something I did, and I sculpted, I played games with my eyes, and I always was a form builder. Uh, I grew up with really genius, inventive people. You know, the, the Oregonians of 50 years ago built their own homes. They made their, they, there was no such thing as a repairman, you know. So you grew, the hand and the mind grew up together. Um, and it's been important to experience, and I feel very blessed to have lived through the biggest transition, maybe, in human history. And maybe it'll be the biggest transition that it will ever take place in human history. It's bigger than the Industrial Revolution, it's bigger than the harnessing of fire. The digital age has not only helped us, but it's taken us, and it is driving us forward. I, it's important to note that my stance on this is that we still must be the pilot and let technology be the passenger. Um, I'm going to end with Cher. Uh, I just, Cher's out on the road now, and uh, I've had the great fortune of working with her <coughs> a couple times. And I end with Cher because 40 years ago, who would have thought at 16 years old, I would have had a huge crush on a woman, and then I'd be working with her someday. And I still have a crush on her. <laughs> so that's Cher, ladies and gentlemen. And I think the economy is turning because um, this season alone, we've sent out Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Miley Cyrus and Cher, all the lady pop stars are going out, and they're not stupid. That's because the economy is turning, and it's time to go out in the world. So I, it's a very exciting time for entertainment. Let me talk about uh, the golden minute. And like I said, I've, I spend my life, and I have for 30 years, jetting around and being lucky enough to be at the part of, at the very beginning of many projects, big projects, projects that take three to five years, and millions and millions of dollars, and it's, so I get to see the best in the world sit in a room and dream and design and work together in collaboration and work together individually. And I've noticed some commonalities among the most brilliant thinkers, and it is very important that one observes the way their collaborators work. I've, like I said, I had I've had great mentors, the best in the world. I've had people like William Friedkin, the director of The Exorcist, decide to give me master classes because he could see a drive and a genuine interest and an authenticity in the process. And so I've learned and taken copious notes over the years, but my talk tonight is really based on a dissatisfaction I've had with the creative community over the last 10 years. And it's been brewing, and I've been talking about it. And I feel very unembarrassed to be direct about the idea that referencing so much before we present an idea, literally researching the bejesus out of every subject before you give it any, any of your own natural thought, any of your own natural time, what is happening is that it first started 10 years ago where the same 17 pictures started showing up in every designer's little book they brought because everybody was looking at the same thing. It started with a generic sort of approach to an idea, and so there was never any chance for the idea to have an original spark, an innovative process. And it's something that has gotten to the point now where I control a lot. I have 45 staff members. Um, most of them have been with me 10 years, so we're a very tight group. And I'm really very controlling now about how, to, how a uh, conceptual session goes. The golden minute is a term that I coined that talks about the moment when, allowed to, the human mind generates incredible signals. Those signals are not random. I don't believe in random. I do believe in instincts. But what instincts really are is the summation of all your discipline, hard work, and practice being buried in this memory bank, which is extraordinary. We're so caught up in talking about computers, so many people forget that this supercomputer will not be replicated. They say in 40 years, there'll be a computer that can have the intelligence of a seven-year-old human. We have 40 billion neurons firing at three or 400 times a second, 17 trillion 
firings a second going on right now. My, when you're seeing my pictures, it goes up to a thousand firings per second. So what happens is that we have this extraordinary computer and we forget about it. We are more likely to go research pictures and sort of see what others have done before you even give yourself the moment of allowing it to pass through you. And it only takes a minute. I feel like a coach up here saying you could lose weight with one minute a day. You can succeed in solving problems that are more appropriate. Your solution is more appropriate because it came through you. And it came through your natural filters. And I'm going to jump ahead and say others will respect and recognize that. The problem with so many people being aware through media, every, your audience in my case, or your coworkers in your case, they're really very aware of things now too because they look at the same stuff you are. So you have a very astute, aware audience who is conditioned to see plagiarism, copies, you know, people that are parroting other ideas. When an individual steps forward and it is recognized that their idea is individual, good or bad, it already commands respect and a certain ability to lead. And this is one of the things that I've noticed in, in powerful people. I'm not talking about myself at all. I have been a, I lead a team, but I have the wonderful advantage of working with people who are, who are far more brilliant than I am. Um, and with humility and respect, I work with them. The other thing that it takes to be a successful creator is um, an unbelievable self-assurance that the idea will come. And so it's a terrifying moment. This is why I say it's a terrifying moment, because what I do with, I, every week I read a couple scripts, listen to a piece of music that I'm going to do an opera, and I know that I need to extract some significance out of this material. And so I very carefully, I have a favorite place in my studio, and it's 10 o'clock at night, a cup of tea. I crack open that script and I read the first page. That same sketchbook you see in our opening graphic, I filled up 400 of them. What happens? These blushes of ideas, and sometimes it's a color, sometimes it's a texture, sometimes it's a full committed environment, sometimes it's a word, sometimes it's a sound. All of them go down, and all of them are to be trusted. And when I work in collaboration, like a midwife, I help others birth these ideas. It's free association, it's Rorschach, it's all the things that seem to take spontaneity. And I really think people need to practice spontaneity. It makes you better, it makes you funnier, it makes you much more conversational, and you're going to be more successful with your peers if this is followed. So all I'm asking people to do is to take a minute, whether it becomes the golden minute or not. I get terribly excited because I'm competitive with myself, and so there's a fear of an unmet challenge. And so when, when, when I pour it on, and this is what I mean, unleashing creativity on demand, you really can practice this thing. It does take practice. And I think that um, I've seen it. I've had people thank me for giving them that, that advice. And it's so simple. And I think that it has to do with stepping back a little bit um, from the assistance of reference and at least giving it a chance to breathe on your own. And it, in my case, in my world, if my ideas aren't original, you don't succeed. The people, who don't, the people who have generic ideas in my field are at the bottom, second, third, fourth tier level people. It's very competitive. We're competitive with ourselves. Our guests, our viewers are very, very knowledgeable about this. And like I said, they'll judge you accordingly. So some of the techniques to help this. Um, everybody in my studio that designs is at a stand-up desk. It's been proven that the, the cerebral cortex works better when you're balancing yourself. The German, uh, German uh, neurologists have developed this wobble hypothesis where you, elderly people with Alzheimer's, wear a shoe that magnetically creates disturbances on the sole of the feet that mimic balance. Their minds work better. So many ideas happen in the shower where there's all this, there's, you're off balance, your eyes are closed. You always hear people doing this. So I'm a mover. I shape an idea. I walk, I have a table in the middle of the room and I literally have to feel the idea. I use my hands to get a hold of it, to feel a different way of doing it, take a walk, um, but don't cop out 
and borrow somebody else's idea. It's not only unethical, it doesn't feel good at the end. I've had successes that were, were, were truly from me and from others, and you know the difference. So it's a very simple proposition, this notion of the golden minute, how to unleash creativity and idea making on your own terms, and you can practice it very easily. It requires no special skills other than what you already possess within your own training. So thank you.